Whenever you turn something, you need a force, and of course you need a pivot involved as well. But of course, if you push with the same force further away from the pivot, then you're able to turn the thing more easily. So we need something to describe this physically. This is where moments come in. A moment is literally just the force that you apply to something times the distance that forces away from the pivot. However, there is a little bit of a caveat with this one. We need to add in distance, brackets, from pivot perpendicular to the forces line of action. Now let's just think of units for one second. Of course, force is measured in newtons, distance is measured in meters. So of course, adding those up, just putting those together, we just have moments are measured in newton meters. Moment is also known as a turning force. It's also known as torque. So for instance, if I have a seesaw here, here's my pivot. Here's a mass on this end and its force is acting downwards, obviously. And let's say its weight is 20 newtons. Obviously we have to deal with the force, not just its mass. Its distance from the pivot is two meters. Therefore, put simply, the moment is equals to the force, which is 20 times distance, so it's going to be 2 times 20, that gives us 40 newton meters. However, if I had a 40 newton weight, I want this seesaw to balance. Where would I have to put that? Well, you probably realize that I have to put it halfway between the pivot and the end of the plank, assuming that it's the same length either side. So that means that this distance here is going to be one meter. What is the moment of this 40 newton weight? Well, it's 40 times one, and therefore that equals 40 newton meters as well. You probably realize that this is now going to be balanced. It's not going to turn. So that means it's in equilibrium. In order for something to be in equilibrium, there needs to be no resultant force. So that means it's not moving up, down, left, right, whatever. And also that means it's not turning due to a force either. Now the principle of moments is, for an object to be in equilibrium, the sum of the anti-clockwise moments have to equal the sum of the clockwise moments. Now of course, looking at this weight here, if it wasn't for this weight here, which way would this weight pull the beam? Well of course the beam would go downwards, so that's anti-clockwise around the pivot. What about this one here? If it wasn't for this weight, this weight would cause a moment that would pull the beam clockwise. In order to balance, we need this moment to equals this moment. And of course, if you have other moments involved on this side, then you need the same sum of moments on this side as well. So the first thing you need to do is realize when you have a moment, which direction is it pulling? Is it pulling clockwise or anti-clockwise? That's nice and easy when you have a system which actually has a nice pivot that's nice and obvious. But what about if we have a lighting rig? Here I have a lighting rig, say, above a theatre stage. It's held up by two cables, and those two cables are supporting the weight of the light that's hanging off the beam, and also the weight of the beam itself. Now, sometimes you'll get given a question which will expect you to take into account the weight of the beam, and sometimes you won't. 99% of the time, the weight for an object, like a beam, is going to be right in the centre. Now I can tell you the weight of the light is 200 newtons. The weight of the beam is 80 newtons. Now, this time there's no obvious pivot, but the system is still in equilibrium, so the same must be true as it was earlier. The sum of the clockwise moments have to equal the sum of the anti-clockwise moments. The question is, is where is our pivot? Where do we say our distances are from? What's weird is that it doesn't matter where you take moments about. You can call, for now, any point on this system a pivot, and it will still work. As a rule of thumb, when we're trying to find out two unknowns, the first thing we want to do is make one of them the pivot itself. So we're literally removing this one from the equation. So if this is our pivot, and these are our distances here, then we can fairly easily find out what the forces of the tension in the cables is going to be. So what we need to do is create our own equation using the idea that the sum of the anti-clockwise moments equals the sum of the clockwise moments. So 
using this as our pivot, which way is the lamp pulling? Well, that's obviously going to be clockwise. The weight of the beam, that's obviously clockwise as well. The only one going anti-clockwise is the tension in the cable. So we therefore know that the moments due to this and this added up are going to be equals to the moment due to the tension. So let's have a go at that then. So we're going to say 0 0.5 times 200. That's the moment due to the light. Plus 1 times 80. That's our moment due to the beam. It's going to be equals to the tension T2 times, well, our distance is 2. It's going to be equals to 2T2. All we have to do then is rearrange that to find the answer. You can have a go with that now if you want to. Hopefully, you've got the tension in T2 as 90 newtons. So what about if we wanted to find out what the tension of T1 is? Well, we could use T2 as our pivot now, because then we'd have the moment due to this, and this added up equals the moment due to T1. We could, but there is an easier way, because we know the two conditions for equilibrium are that the sum of the clockwise moments equals the sum of the anti-clockwise moments, but also there's no resultant force. In other words, all the downwards forces equals all the upwards forces. So we can take a shortcut. If you've only got one more force involved, then you don't have to take moments, which is kind of nifty. So we know that T2 plus T1, so that's T1 plus 90, is going to be equals to 200 plus 80. That's just saying that the upwards forces equals the downwards forces. Nothing to do with moments now, because we've only got one force left to find out. That gives us a tension of 190 newtons. So providing that you remember the two conditions needed for an object to be in equilibrium, you can work all of this out yourself. As with a whole load of things in mechanics, getting good at these requires practice. So find some questions. So far, we've only seen situations where the forces are opposite to each other. So up and down and left to right, etc. But what if they're at different angles? Let's say that we have a wall here and we have a shelf and we have a piece of wire keeping up this shelf. Let's say that we have a bunch of flowers hanging in a little hanging basket here. Delightful. That are pulling down with a weight W1. And I'm going to call the length of this beam L. The only thing that's keeping this up is this piece of string that's halfway across the beam attached to it there. I'm going to call that T because it's got a tension, but it's pulling up at an angle. Now that's a bit of a problem because, of course, well, we've got this moment pulling clockwise, this moment pulling, well, kind of anti-clockwise, but they're not directly opposite to each other. Here's our pivot here, by the way. The moment due to this one is just L times W1. That's nice and easy. But here, it's not as simple as T times L over 2. Like we saw earlier, any moment is equal to the force times the perpendicular distance from the pivot to the forces line of action. What does that even mean? Well, if I drew the forces line of action right here, here's our tension, and I extended it, it would extend out that way, it would extend out that way. All that we're showing is the direction that the force is actually pulling in. So what distance is perpendicular from this line of action to the pivot? Well, it's not from here to here because, of course, that wouldn't be perpendicular to the line of action. Instead, it's going to be this here. Can you see? I've just drawn a line that is 90 degrees perpendicular to the line of action to the pivot. That's my distance there. Now, usually what you'll be given is this angle here. I'm going to call that theta. Now, you could spend ages thinking about, OK, well, where does theta fit into this triangle here? And then where's the distance and all that jazz? But what you'll find ultimately is that 
in order to find out the moment due to this, it's going to be the force times the distance times cos or sine theta. So actually, more often than not, what we can just do is figure out, hmm, well, actually, the amount of this tension that's pulling upwards perpendicular to the beam, that's actually going to be T cos theta. All we're doing is finding out how much of the total force pulling in that direction is being used to balance this moment here. Not all of the tension is going to be used. If you don't know how I got to this, have a look at my easy vectors trick video and that will sort you out on that. So now it's just as simple as saying, well, T cos theta times L over 2 equals W1 times L. So the moment due to the hanging basket here is equals to the moment of the tension that is perpendicular to the distance to the pivot here. Sometimes you'll have forces that are in completely different directions to each other. Let's look at a children's roundabout. Uh, let's put some handles on there. I'm going to say the radius of this roundabout is R. Let's say that we have Jimmy pushing with F1, and then we have Julie who's pushing in the opposite direction with F2. Now if we draw in the perpendicular distances from the force to the pivot, we end up with these. What you'll find is that these forces are 90 degrees to each other. They are perpendicular to each other, but the same still applies. F1 is trying to push the roundabout round anti-clockwise. F2 is trying to push it clockwise. Last thing you'll come across is toppling. Put simply, if you have something like a wardrobe, and providing that, there's our pivot by the way, and providing that the center of mass, which is usually right in the center itself, is has not gone past the pivot point, then it's not going to topple over. As soon as this center of mass moves over past the pivot point, then it's going to topple over because, of course, the moment due to the center of mass isn't going to be pulling it anti-clockwise anymore, but actually is going to start turning it clockwise. The last thing that you need to know about when it comes to moments is the idea of couples. Let's say that you have a steering wheel. Now, usually when you're supposed to turn a steering wheel your, your hands are supposed to be at 10 and 2 but let's pretend that your hands are here and here. Opposite sides of the wheel. If I wanted to turn right then my left hand has to go up and my right hand has to go down. But I should be pulling with the same force with each hand. Now of course the pivot is right in the middle here but my hands are two are apart. That's twice the radius or twice the distance from my hand to the pivot. The moment of a couple is equal to the total moment or the sum of the moments. But that's actually not how we define it. If we actually try and figure out what moments we've got going on here, obviously we've got F times R plus F times R. Both of them are pulling. This one's pulling clockwise. This one's pulling clockwise as well. This is not in equilibrium. And by the way, that's probably something I should have said earlier. Systems are not always in equilibrium. It's only when we talk about things that are in equilibrium that the moments are equals to each other. So, of course, that's going to be FR plus FR. What you'll notice is that equals to 2 f r but how we actually define it is saying it's one of the forces times distance between forces so that's going to be f times 2 r which again gives you 2 f r so it's a bit of a weird definition but that is the definition that you need to know. So I hope you found this video helpful. If you have, make sure you give it a like and I'll see you next time.